So this last week, I stole a look at an advanced screening of Honest Thief, starring Liam Neeson, Jai, I've Given Up Trying to Be Likeable Courtney, and Robert Patrick. And it was your annual dose of Liam Neeson action, but like so much in 2020, distressingly unsatisfying. Honest Thief comes just a year after Neeson's last movie, Cold Pursuit, on the press tour for which a combination of context-sensitive remarks led some to believe that the Irishman's career was cancelled. But for better or worse, the late-period Neeson action train rolls ever onward. We open with Neeson, who we'll come to know as Tom Dolan, blowing open an old-fashioned bank vault at night while news voiceovers warn us that there's a mysterious serial bank robber on the loose. We then cut to the office of a self-storage facility where Neeson undergoes an awkward meet-cute with the mature but still age-inappropriate proprietor, Annie. Cut to a year later and Tom and Annie are an item. He wants her to move in with him, but she's hesitant and we can tell that Tom wants to confess his past. So the next day, holed up in a hotel, Tom calls the FBI and identifies himself as the infamous in and out bandit. Tom makes them a deal. He'll return every penny of the $9 million that he has stolen in return for a reduced sentence. Beer was skeptical, but after some convincing, they agree to pay him a visit. Days later, a pair of agents finally show, and Tom tells them that the money is at the storage facility. But when the agents get there, they see a chance to get rich quick by taking the cash for themselves. The only problem is, Tom and Annie is witnesses. And from there, Tom quickly finds himself on the run and forced to tap into his particular set of skills in order to save the woman he loves. The first and really only thing that stands out about this film is that there's a quantity of acting, but not quality. So many of the dialogue exchanges, whether it's an intimate moment, an argument, or one character staring down the barrel of another's gun, are slow, stilted conversations with little to no background noise or score. To be sure, Neeson buoys every scene that he's in. Like Tom Cruise running or Tom Hanks peeing, he knows that his strength is in a threatening phone call. But even his gravelly drawl can't salvage the sheer tonnage of trailer-grade exposition that's foisted upon him and every other speaking part. Consider the monologue from Taken. It's detailed but precise, and it cements the film's conflict in one minute. Here, though, every character just robotically, repeatedly states, and only states, their identities, feelings, and goals whenever they open their mouths. It would not faze me to learn that this script was for an audio drama, and a first draft at that. Consequently, while tension does pick up in the second act, a perpetual vibe of predictability remains. You will be helpless to imagine how a better director or screenwriter, or at least ones with more time and money to kill, could have replaced these jaw-flapping interludes with nonverbal acting or a well-timed camera adjustment. I will credit the film for being progressive in its accessibility, though, because blind audience members will be able to perfectly follow what is going on here. By extension, the characterization of our lead players suffers. Even if you didn't see the trailer, you'll be slapping your knee in frustration as to why Tom, a professional thief, initially trusts two cops to access his money without him taking along. And when a character is revealed to be married with children early on, you better believe that's coming back for a token raising of the stakes. The villain is as one-dimensional as they come, and conversely, Tom is portrayed as a sympathetic crook to the point of logical inconsistency. In addition to a tragic backstory, it's revealed that he's never actually spent any of the money that he's stolen, and he just started doing it to stick it to rich guys. Which, I guess, makes him the hoarder version of Robin Hood. I mean, the commuter commented on the 1% too, but there, the whole dilemma of Neeson's protagonist was desperation over losing his job. He wasn't a millionaire nearing retirement age and only now wondering if he's in the wrong line of work. This is the first Neeson vehicle that just feels held back by its star's age, rather than enhanced by, or at least conscious of it. You've got the obligatory reference to his military pedigree, the Marines this time, also mind-sweeping, uh, but much of its runtime is its sit time. Neeson spends so much of the first act chilling in a hotel room that I was afraid we were in for another remake of Old Boy at first. Indeed, the film is glaringly stingy with both its sets and its setting. Aside from a couple of expansive establishing shots of Boston, you won't find any of the globetrotting or even general sense of motion which populates Neeson's back catalog. The film is predominantly framed as a gallery of small, cheap-looking interiors. The blinds of the storage facility which Annie operates are never open, and everywhere else, from FBI office space to a dilapidated safe house, are lit by a series of conveniently bright white windows. The film also has probably the most disproportionate ratio of simple driving scenes to car chases that I've ever seen in an action thriller. If non-stop was planes and the commuter was trains, then Honest Thief is automobiles for how many mid-range suburban vehicles Tom hotwires on his quest for vengeance. The sole car chase of any real significance is set in streets that make the opening of Vanilla Sky look like gridlock. 
Helps the film age better for a post-COVID audience, I guess. To its credit, the film does make some attempts to distinguish its overall narrative. The story highlights how Tom wants to turn over a new leaf, so while he's by no means a pacifist, his shootouts are all in self-defense and he never kills anybody. It's a shame the director couldn't find a way to make this non-violent persona stand out more with the Manisan archetype, or to focus on making what moments of action do arise all the more memorable. But there's no brawl as distinctive as, say, fighting a guy with an oxygen mask or an electric guitar. None which satisfyingly escalates throughout a location of clear geography like the brothel shootout or the climax on a yacht in Taken. There's no Hitchcockian mystery to provide a thoughtful undercurrent filling the cracks between action beats. A scene where Tom proves his identity by meticulously describing his M.O., and another where he tinkers with some bomb tech, are the few practical exposition dumps that show a glint of cleverness. Yet ultimately, in a film about a master thief and detonations expert, we only see Neeson execute one heist, and the one bomb that explodes is planted off-screen, and results in a puff of CGI fire that somehow generates little debris and no shockwave. I mean, come on guys, even Monty Python had the budget to actually blow some stuff up. A couple of stray thoughts. There were a lot of movie trailers before this movie. Comeback Trail, The Father, Morbius, Spiral, 355, uh, an International Lady Assassin Squad is cool. I don't know why they had to make it sound like a sports radio station. Uh, Wonder Woman 84, and another Liam Neeson film, The Marksman. I can only imagine that this is Hollywood compensating for a lack of new releases by going all out on promoting ones that have already been delayed a year or two. Uh, also this strangely edible Diet Coke ad. There's a secondary character, an FBI agent who totes a puppy everywhere and is in the middle of a divorce, who comes off as a failed vessel for all the memorable character touches that would have been better evenly distributed across the rest of the cast. He is also the only person who even attempts the Boston accent. One funny line from a guy at the FBI negotiating with Tom, he's complaining about his nickname and no one wants to arrest him. And one of the better lines from Neeson, I've got the security footage, prick. Tom does the obligatory disposing of the cell phone when the bad guys give chase, which compels him to use the last internet cafe in the continental U.S. when he gets to Boston. Tom gets into a gunfight when hijacking a bakery truck, which presents a fatal missed opportunity to have him line up a shot through a donut hole. Neeson jumps a fence at one point, which is accomplished with fewer cuts than Taken 3, so points for that. Tom refers to Annie as his lady friend once, which is novel to my ears as a term of sincere endearment. Maybe they figured a girlfriend was pushing it when he looks old enough to be your dad? The ending implies a Baby Driver-esque bittersweet resolution, but I want more of that Bonnie and Clyde dynamic that they set up in the third act. She's into it! Tom says he has nine million dollars, six in one place and three in another, but you never see anybody actually count or look at all of it. Are you telling me the studio didn't even have the resources to put together a Breaking Bad tier fat stack? Also, her full name is Annie Wilkins, which I only mentioned because I found it distractingly close to Annie Wilkes. I guess this film is a different kind of misery. So if Tom is a smooth criminal and needs to make sure Annie is okay, then... Wait a minute! Well, I guess this movie is bad. Overall, I'd give this film a 3.5 out of 10. There's a smattering of acceptable action scenes and some good line deliveries from the titular burglar, but they don't rise above the production's overall cheapness and lack of ambition. While it gets off to a compelling high-concept start and feigns at setting his performance apart from the crowd, this is pretty low on the Neeson meter. It's not offensively bad like some entries. The execution is just too routine to merit repeat viewings. It's a plain love story meets a plain crooked cop story, plain and simple. But what's also plain and simple is that you definitely should not see this movie if you're not willing and able to do so safely. Par for the course these days, I skipped out on concessions and caught a lightly attended screening, although there were still somehow those people who talked during the previews. Nevertheless, basking in the glow of the silver screen, I was reminded of just how important an institution a movie theater is for the community. I just hope that both the major chains and indie theaters alike can bounce back once enough people keep their masks on, and we can all enjoy an evening show with a full house again. Just when you do, maybe consider seeing something better than this.